um, the call is being recorded, so you know, bear that in mind. And yeah, let's start by introducing ourselves. Now that we are still few, we can run through that very quickly. Timilene, do you want to go first? Timilene, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, Jada. Sorry, I can hear you. Hi, Timilene. Okay, good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are, everyone. My name is Timilene. I work as a product manager at InterSwitch. Um, what else do you want to know? Um, location, name, location, what you do. Location currently in Lagos. Currently. Remotely available, but currently in Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um rita i'm not sure if I, i'm pronouncing your name correctly can you introduce yourself rita can you hear me okay i any if you're not in a place where you can talk you can just um introduce yourself in the in the chat box that's allowed as well so I any Rita. Okay. Okay. Rita says, my name is Rita. I'm a product manager and I reside in Lagos. Awesome. Nice to have you here, Rita. I any we want to know you. Do you want to introduce yourself? And if you're not where you can talk, you can type in the chat box as well. That's allowed. Can anyone hear me? Ayani, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, I can hear you. Okay. I'm not sure Ayani can hear me. Okay, so um, welcome once again to Bits and Bytes by Techlytics. This is going to be an interesting and power-packed webinar. So let's all prepare our minds to receive, you know, knowledge. So I'm about to share my screen and just run us through what Techlytics is and what we do right before we introduce our speaker. So yeah, we are in Bits and Bytes by Techlytics. And Techlytics is a company that, how I like to think of it is we have like two sides of operations. So there's the part where we do um, technology workforce development, and there's the part where we do tech consulting, right? So our focus is on preparing professionals for the future of work. And so far, we have mentored more than 3,000 fellows across um, various educational technology institutions and corporate settings. Um, we also offer consulting services to startups and enterprises alike on digitization and management. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve is the problem of the evolution of work. Um, especially around COVID-19 time, um, there was a lot of things happening. Everything was going really fast. And the trend of what skill was in demand changed, right? And employers were beginning to value, you know, different skills. And that sort of created a skill gap, right? And this is where Techlytics comes in. We're basically trying to fill up that skill gap and basically train people to have the value that employers want. So um, the solution we are offering is we are providing on-demand online courses to equip young professionals with the necessary skills that they need to succeed in a tech and non-tech you know, role in their workplace. 
that brings us to bits and bytes. So bits and bytes is an interesting monthly tech series hosted by seasoned professionals. Um, during this webinar, we delve into the world of technology and decode really complex um, concepts and cutting edge, we explore cutting edge trends. So I know that as product managers and not just product managers are here to be, to be fair, as tech professionals and people who are hoping to branch into tech, there are some scary um, terms and scary concepts basically that, you know, is okay, you don't want to go near when you hear anything data analytics, you, you run away from it. Basically, bits and bytes is here to decode all those things and make it really simple for you to understand. So our traction at Techlytics so far, we're family known as Rainmaker, and we started off as a YouTube channel um, that used to teach um, Excel, take Excel courses and all of that. And we had 88 students while we're still known as Rainmaker. And then we rebranded as Techlytics. And yeah, the name changed in 2022, February 25. Since then, we have had 727 new signups. We have completed 103 lectures. We have um, taken 30, over 30 courses. We have 111 active students and our YouTube subscribers are now at 275. By the way, I would really like if, you know, you go subscribe to our Techlytics YouTube channel if you're not subscribed already. There's a lot of information there that you can get for free. I mean, what other people charge for, we're giving it out for free on our YouTube channel. So please try to check that out and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. So yeah, meet Oluwata Yowekule. She's the founder and lead now at Techlytics. Um, she's a chartered banker, a certified MS Excel specialist and certified safe practitioner. Um, she has a proven track record of breaking complex con concepts to relatable bits. I don't want to speak too much English. Tayo is a genius when it comes to teaching and there are a lot of students that can, that can say that confidently. I can say that confidently as a student of hers. So yeah, know that you have come to the best place. The rest of our team is myself, Jeja Okonkwo. I'm a product manager. We have Mary, our graphics designer, and we have Adenike, our data analyst. Adenike, you can say hi um, in the chat box so they know who you are. So finally, the interesting part that I know you guys have been waiting for, meet our speaker of the day, Emeka. Emeka. Emeka is a senior of seniors. And I know this because I've had interactions with him where he has, when he speaks, see, even if he's coughing, just listen because he's coughing sense, right? So not to talk of when he's now speaking intentionally. So he's really good at what he does. He's a senior um, fintech products manager, and he has a passion for identifying pertinent issues, providing solutions, and delivering exceptional user experiences. So he is part of the people that contributed to the success of Access, Bank, Access Bank's QuickBooks app, Interswitch's QuickTeller, and Oze's Booking app. Lastly, he's a certified um, professional scrum business owner and he advocates for agile methodologies so with a round of applause and i know that you can all you don't have to unmute your mic to give you a round of applause but you see that clapping emoji look for it look for it in your, before i call him look for the clapping emoji already so with a round of applause make it loud we cannot hear it but like you know when you clap so much that thing now explodes yeah, that's what I want to see on the screen. So with a round of applause, please welcome on our virtual stage, Emeka. Emeka, welcome. Hi, Jedida. Thank you very much for that um, sounding welcome. Um, 
the biography was a little bit a little. That's a point I was thinking, am I really the one you're introducing like this? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Tayo. Thank you, Tech Politics, for this opportunity to uh, to impact knowledge. Um, sharing knowledge, especially as it relates to product management, is something that I always look forward to do, right? Um, I was also taught, and uh, before this call started officially, I made mention that I had one of my teachers on the call. So I'm actually glad that he's here to see that he started teaching me, and now um, he would have to listen to me speak as well, especially on this very topic that is critical to both product managers and founders. Yeah, so thank you very much, um, Jedida and the team. Okay, you're still sharing your screen. I don't know if I can proceed to share mine. Let me just stop sharing now. Okay. All right, you have the floor. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll need it to confirm once you can see my screen, please. I can see your screen. Okay. Thank you, Tara. Uh, just you can see your screen. So we can start officially. Okay. All right, so um, today's topic is something that is very, very important, like I said, uh, not just to me, the presenter or the speaker, or the techlytics, the organizers, but I believe it is something that the audience, you that can hear me and can see my screen, uh, looking forward to, you know, from, and that is why you sign up for this session and join the call. As product managers, I know that there are a lot of product managers on this call. Um, you know, I listen when you introduce yourself. So, yeah, I'm one of you. I'll be introducing myself properly shortly. But let's look at the topic that we have to discuss today, right? Um, as product managers, I'll start with product managers if I get to founders. You know, I know there are times, there are situations that I know most of us have also experienced this. Myself, I've experienced it countless number of times when you speak to users you know during your exploration phase you speak to users you try to understand their pain points identify their challenges the gaps that they have then you become very ecstatic about solving those problems you're looking forward to building the product that would solve the problem then you go ahead to build then when you release the product in the market the adoption is not what you anticipated it's not what you expected right and then you begin to ask questions is it that i didn't build the right thing or what exactly was the problem right today we're going to look at product management end to end and then we're going to try to identify some of the reasons why that can happen and then for founders you identify a problem that you feel you want to build a business on then you start a startup or you build a product or start up a business whichever the case is and you realize that it's you're actually spending more than you had budgeted for for a startup right uh, for a startup in its early stage you have to minimize cost so you can maximize profit but we've seen you know founders founders in their early days or startups in their early days spending so much money on building a product right so these issues these problems are typical of you know the the software development space or the technology space in Nigeria, right? And so today we're going to look at um, how can we solve these problems, you know, starting with what are the options available for founders to build fast and what are the options available for product managers to build that first version of their products, right? Without actually spending so much on resources and spending so much time in taking their products to market such that by, by the time they go to market they become very late and become second movers and we're also going to look at you know the journey i'm going to take on the journey starting from the very beginning of product management and then terminating you know with the best solution we can adopt to solve these problems that i have mentioned earlier right so yeah i'm excited to go on this journey with you and i'm sure you're also excited as well so yeah, my name is Emeka Okemadu. Uh, like Jenida introduced me earlier, I've been doing product management for about five years and a few months now. 
Um, I started my product management career in the banking industry, uh, basically working as a product manager in Access Bank. So I was one of the team that developed the very first, uh, should I call it the pioneer uh, digital lending solution that you know, ushered in a new era of lending in Nigeria and the Nigerian banking uh, sector. I from there went to InterSuite where I also started managing the Quickteller app and then you know, build and firm up my product management experience in the payments industry. I'm currently doing SME stuff with Jose right now in both Nigeria and the Ghana market, the Ghanaian markets, as well as you know, expanding into South African markets to solve SME problems, mostly around financial management and digital lending, right? Um, I always love to say this whenever I introduce myself because it's something that I won't say I'm proud of, but most people don't actually think that <laughs> I can do, right? So for fun, I always like to cook. I like to cook a lot. Um, yeah, I have to put a lot because I actually do like to cook. In my free time, you can find me exploring new recipes, you know, trying out new kind of recipes to cook. So that's what I love to do for fun. So yeah, meet me. This is my biography. I'm also looking forward to connecting with you all at the end of this session. So feel free, I'm sharing my LinkedIn profile at the end of this call. So you can follow me, we can connect and then share knowledge and then network as well. So let's look at what we'll be looking at today. Oh, sorry, I need to put this on slideshow. Okay, so basically today, like I said, we'll be going on a journey, right? Um, for us to understand how we can use no code to build products, to build our MVPs very fast. Right, we need to first of all go back and join you. Right, we need to go back to the very uh, scratch of product management to understand our users or to understand who users are. When we hear the word users, who are they exactly? Right, then we will look at what exactly is the product, what are the features products should have, and um, the product development processes, the challenges with the product development processes that will then give rise to us understanding the concept of MVP. Right, what is an MVP? Uh, I know some of us have had MVP several, but we don't know what it is, or we have a different understanding of what it is. On this call, we're going to share ideas, we're going to exchange knowledge to learn more about MVPs, right? Then we'll move forward to look at okay, we know what MVPs are now. How do we then build this MVP without breaking the bank or without spending so much time on delivery and go to market? And then we're going to build a live MVP product using no code on this call, right? So that's the journey. This is highlights of the journey we're going to go on today. So if you are excited, jump on board me, the spaceship, so we can ride, all right? So let's move on. But I always like to do this before I start. I always like to play a game, right? Um, it's a way of, you know, helping me and you understand that this session is not just a presentation, but it is mostly of a conversation, sort of like a class, right? So feel free to ask questions. Um, I'll ask questions as well. So it's going to be conversational, right? So we're going to play a game. It's a very straightforward game, right? Um, this is a sentence, and there are Fs in this sentence. So I want you to read this sentence. I'm going to time. It's just in, in 20 seconds so that we don't waste time. So let me set my timer before we start. Okay, so we're going to read this sentence and then in the comments, uh, in the chat section of this call, just drop how many Fs you were able to count, right? So your time starts now. So let's go. Sorry. Stop sharing. So feel free to count and drop your your answers in the chat session of this call. Okay, I'm saying okay, your time is up. Let me see how many people got this. Uh Okay, you guys are still dropping. Uh, we have 14 people on this call, 13 excluding me. And we have just um, 
six responses. Okay, sorry, are some of you still counting? Again, the time is up. So we have six, just six entries. Okay, so let's count together. So I actually like playing this game because I got it wrong the first time. So I always feel happy when I see people fail it because I know that I wasn't the only one that got it wrong the very first time. Right, so there are actually six Fs here. Uh, this is the first. This one, two, uh, three, four, five, and then six, right? So let's see how many people got it right. We just have, um, oh, Dora got it right. Congratulations, Dora. Ekene got it right. Ayeni got it right as well. So Dora, Ekene, and Ayeni, please feel free to leave your phone numbers in the chat section. There is a gift for you. Techletics will reach out to you after this call. You've just won yourself some awesome gifts. All right. So don't forget, leave your phone numbers on the chat, at least. Otherwise, you won't get the gift. Though. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. Okay. So, like I said, let's start with users, right? So let me put this back in the slide. Show. Um, I always have a general philosophy when I want, whenever I want to explain who users are or whenever I want to talk about users, right? I always start with um, Leonel Robbins' definition of economics, right? For some of us who are economic students or who still remember the economics, you will know that the very, you know, the very common quotes that human wants are limited, right? Due to scarce resources, human wants are limited. Now, what it means is we as human beings, we always have a need. We always have a want, right? Because we are, we always find ourselves, you know, having to want more, right? And as a result of that, we create gaps for ourselves. And when we create gaps, we find out that we start looking for things to fill up those gaps, all right? So generally users can be qualified as people who always have problems sorry to say it may come off wrong but yeah users are people or they are individuals who always have a need who always have a want right they always have problems they they're looking for satisfaction all right and generally as well so like i said having problems means you have challenges that you're looking for a solution to to um to resolve right Having a gap means you're looking for something to fill up that gap. However, you are only aware to the extent of your problems. What it means is we are oblivious of what we actually want, right? We only know what we feel in terms of the problem, but we don't really know what the solution to that problem is. As we progress in this um, conversation, uh, you, will, you will get to understand why I'm making these statements now, right? And it's very important that we know this. Users have problems, but they do not really know how to solve those problems. And that is where we founders and product managers come in. So, and human needs, human wants generally are dynamic. Uh, preferences are always changing. I always used to tell my uh, developers that, or my colleagues at work that, whenever a user sleeps and wakes up, they are, preferences change right and it changes as a result of two things one is they may no longer have the problems that they just slept with probably because someone else has solved it or because they've moved past that problem or there is a trend right trends happen you know the world is dynamic and we move with that uh, with the dynamic world our preferences change as the world uh, changes as well right so those are key reasons why we can see you know human needs or human wants changing so bringing it home all of us are users as long as we have a problem as long as we have a challenge that we're seeking to solve right it means we are users we need something we're looking for something to use to address those problems and that's what makes us users right and we are generally actively looking for solutions so this is sort of like to help us understand from the very basics how products come to life or you know when we say products and when we term users what exactly are we talking about right and that is just we generally having a, you know having a general concept of what or who users are 
Now, if I have a problem, yeah, I by default will look for a solution to my problem, just like I've said, we're actively looking for solutions. And that would then lead us to look at what exactly is a product, right? I always say product is a value vehicle. In fact, at some point, I used to call it a value Tesla. Why? Because it is a driver of value. When we look at what the word value means, value simply means um, uh, benefits, right? Uh, when something is valuable to you, it means you gain satisfaction from it. You gain um, some level of benefit or advantage from engaging that thing, right? But then there is no satisfaction if there is no problem because satisfaction has to come first. Sorry, problem has to come first before you are satisfied. You have to have a problem, you have to have a gap that when you use something, then you get satisfaction, right? So a product is that thing that delivers value to users. So anything that you can think of that has a process of developing or that has a process for which it is developed that is either tangible or intangible, if it's physical or not physical, but if fulfills a specific need, right? It solves a problem for you, and at the process, you derive satisfaction and you get value from that thing. That thing is a product, right? That's a very simple definition of it. The word product comes from the word produce, which means you cannot talk about products without actually, you know, emphasizing on the development process, the production actually right so there has to be a production for you to have a product a product is an outcome of a production process right so yeah that is why it's important to mention that there's a development process here so this is just to you know further drive on the points that i just explained on what a product is right so let's look at this person for example uh, this person is bored so if you go back to my definition of who a user is, a user is anybody that has a problem, right? So this guy is bored, he's seated, maybe he has done so many, he has done so much work for the day, and his brain needs an activity or an entertainment, right? And that in the city will call a problem or a need. So he's bored, that is a problem. So for him being bored, there's an opportunity for him to now fulfill his boredom. And that is where his need is now defined as being wanting an activity or at least an entertainment, right? And for somebody who is bored, for me, I don't know about you, if I'm bored, I look for entertainment or I look for an activity. So I would most likely listen to music, I'll watch a movie, or I'll play games, right? So these guys are solving my problems, they're addressing my specific immediate needs and their products. That simply makes them products, right? So that's the simple basic concept of what a product is, right? So just looking at for that, you know, trying to break down, you know, the qualities of a product. A product must always solve a specific need, right? It must have a development process. I think I've said all these things already. It can be physical or intangible. Now, if the reason I'm emphasizing physical or intangible is because most people don't address a service as a product. The service is actually a product that you cannot see. Right, so it's it's very important that we understand that we can also have an intangible product that we call a service. Techlytics, for example, has um, data analytics. Uh, what's it called? Um, consultancy services that they offer. Right, it may not be um, a physical activity that you can touch or that you can feel, but that consultancy service addresses the needs of companies. So yeah, they have a product that they sell. All right and then finally a product must deliver value there's no point for you using a product that you don't benefit from it if you don't benefit from anything that you use it's as good as a feature soup right i won't go into detail what that is but yeah it's as good as a feature soup because you're not getting any value from using that now let's look at the development process remember i said you can't talk about the product without actually talking about product development process now what you're seeing on the board mostly applies to software development products. Um, I know some of us have a different approach to this. In fact, I always used to say, there is no one way of doing product management. If anybody tells you, do it like this, you must do it like this, then the person is either trying to put you in a box or not being open or being honest about the process, right? There's no one way of doing it. But yeah, there are general concepts, there are general principles 
that you can follow when developing process uh, products, right? So these are Asana's from Asana's perspective. Asana is one of the I think one of the product analytics um, companies that provide product management tools, right, for product people. So this from an Asana's perspective, these are there are six stages, right? They've broken this down into the idea generation phase. This is mostly uh, you know, where you do all your brainstorming, where you do a lot of research work, desk research, user research, everything from market research, um, identifying key players, industry or competitor analysis, you know, all those things you do to learn more about the problem and to learn more about the markets, right, are, you know, generally under that phase. And then you go ahead to, you know, the, the solution space where you now get to scope out or refine how you intend to solve the problems you've learned from the ideation phase, right? So I'm going to come back here because this is where we experience a lot of issues and that's why mostly we're on this call, right? So from here, you do your prototyping. So three and four, most times in some organizations are done, they are the same thing, right? But prototyping is basically just, um, you know what the problem is, you've scoped out the solution, what does it look like or what would it look like, right? What's the visual representation of what your solution should look like? And after you've done that, to do your initial designs, your design could range from anything from wireframing, from building high fidelity designs. So that's where your UI US guys come in. Now, the idea behind building a mock up or developing a mock up is for not the fifth phase, right? So you can go back and validate the problems or the hypotheses you've identified in phase one or in stage one. It's not enough for you to. You know, when you do market research, what you're simply trying to do is to say, what exactly is the market? What is this market, right? When we say market, market comprises of two things. One is, who are the guys that have these problems, right? And um, who are the guys that have the problem? How are they solving the problem? How big are they, right? What are the opportunities that exist? if I intend to solve this problem. That's simply what market research seems to, seeks to answer. So when you're doing market research, it's just simply looking at, okay, who are these guys that have these issues that I want to solve, right? And then how big are they, so that I can actually scale my products. If they are not so big, if, if you are doing your market research and you find out that um, the, the problem you want to solve is very limited, I would advise you not to even go into it because what it means is the market, the addressable market isn't that large. So, you most likely be building a product that cannot scale or a business that cannot scale. You can't grow it because the numbers aren't just there, right? So you have to go back and validate. So when you um, speak to users, do your user research, and they tell you, oh, I have this problem. When you build your mock-up, go back to those users and test. Okay, you said you have this issue, right? This is how I'm thinking of solving your problem. Does this actually solve your problems, right? And it's also an opportunity for you to get immediate feedback before you actually commit resources to start building and that's the beauty of a mock-up and then finally well, after validating and testing you go into full-blown development and release right that's a commercialization phase i mean like i said earlier this can vary with organizations can also vary with different product teams so there's no one way right there's no straight through process of doing product management everybody has their own approach but yeah there's a general concept of one you must know the problem before you start you must validate the problems before you go ahead to build and you must scope out the features or the the solution you want to build and it makes sense to actually test those features before sorry to test your solution with users before you start building right so those are like the general principles and your steps can be anything you know uh, but then adopting these principles right so what, what, why are we having issues, right? Where do we have issues with this product development process? Um, for me, right, and I've seen this in some of the organizations I've worked in and, you know, having consulted for some companies as well and also having networked with some product managers and listened to them speak. This process can actually take, <laughs> exploration only can actually take between two to three weeks. If you really want to do a good exploration to learn about users, it can take anything between two to three weeks, right? So the process itself can, you know, be, it can be very long and it can extend the delivery time of a product, right? But the 
point or the phase or the stage I want to focus on mostly is the solution space. The point where we define what we want to build. It's always the point where sometimes we get it very wrong. Most especially as product managers, even as founders, right? When you speak to users, you speak to a user, the user tells you, I'm hungry, right? And the user goes ahead to say, I'm hungry, I want to eat burger, I want to eat uh, sausage, I'm also craving ice cream, right? I also want to eat swallow, a ban, a for you, right? The user will tell you these are his or her problems. But what is the core, what is the fund fundamental issue or the problem that the user has? This is simply hungry, right? So we need to start looking beyond, you know, start looking beyond um, trying to solve every single user problems, right? And that's why there's a, a, this is a tool called roadmap for product managers. Now, when you scope out a solution, when you scope out a feature, it makes sense to identify the key things. What are the key features that this product needs to have? The very first instance that this the, the product needs to have, you need to define those features. And those features need to ad address the immediate core basic fundamental user problems, right? In this scenario, the example I explained or the example I shared with you, right? I would rather just give this guy food because all he wants is food. He wants to eat, assuming he has no allergies, right? At that point in time, he wants to eat. That is the basic thing. So I will look to giving him food to eat. And that will lead us to the conversations around MVPs, right? In a bid to ensure that we are solving the basic core fundamental user problems, then we need to build the very first version of our product that would immediately address that problem, right? And that's basically what an MVP is, a minimum viable product. So before I talk more on an MVP, it's also important that we understand our roles as product managers and as founders, right? Um, I'm quoting one of my best guys, Steve Jobs. He said, people don't really know what they want until you show them, right? You show it to them. Um, I will also borrow this quote from Henry Ford. He said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Right, he's one of the guys that are credited to, you know, um, building the first modern cars in the world today. Right. So, why are these quotes important, and why am I re-emphasizing them? As product managers, our job, I think Steve Jobs also said, uh, it is not the user's job to know what they want. Right. It is our job as product managers, it's our job as founders to know what users want. It is the user's job to know what they feel. It is their job to know what their problems are. It is not their job to know how to solve them. Come on, if users can actually solve their problems, then we don't need to be product managers. We don't need product managers. We don't need founders because these users will go ahead solving their problems as soon as they experience them, right? And that is why we are in the business of solving problems as product managers and as founders. So let's go into what an MVP is fully. Um, I was talking to one of my newbie product managers sometime last week, and I was trying to explain this concept very well. Uh, I didn't know that this was going to come up uh, as I was going to speak on this topic. So an MVP generally is a tool, it's an agile development tool, right? It's a learning tool that software development companies use, mostly to learn. And if I'm to break it down further, what exactly is it? Is that very least, is that very least product, or should I say, is the product with the very least feature or set of features that address immediate customer needs, right? That's just what an MVP is. It's often the first version of your product. So if someone says, oh, I'm building an MVP, saying, okay, this is actually the very first version of my product, and these are the things I want to solve. Now, the mistake we make, and I'm going to use this um, illustration to address it, right? If a user tells you, I want to get to point A to B faster and convenient, right? I'm trying to use this illustration to drive on what an MVP really is. 
this guy wants to just go from point A to B, and he wants to do that conveniently. Now, as a product manager, I spoke to this person, and this was your finding. This was a problem you identified. It's a pain point the user shared with you. How do you go about solving this? Now, during your um, the product definition phase, you know, the point where you scope or you refine your product idea, you might conclude that, oh, this guy actually wants a car, right? What he wants is a car, because what is that thing that can get you from point A to B very fast? He treks every day to work, he's tired of it, he's, he wants to stop trekking, and he wants something that will get him to wherever he's going very fast, and he, needs, he doesn't need to stress himself while using that thing. One thing that would, you know, switch the light bulb on in your head would be a car, right? But then think about it. Um, this user didn't tell you they want a car. They simply said, I want to get from here to here, and I want to do it conveniently. But you thought a car would be the best solution to solve this problem. And then you go ahead, you go ahead scoping, you know, to build a car for this user, right? And you find out that to build a car will take you five years. For example, but again, you want to, you know, you shall want to deliver this car to this user. So you go ahead to start building, you build the first thing, you build the tire, you hand over the tire to users. It's useless to this guy, right? And then you keep building until you get to the very last phase, which is a car. By the time you realize it, it's five years, and this user no longer has this problem. In fact, you'll be surprised that the next time you meet this user, <laughs> he might be on an airplane right because again remember we said dynamic preferences and users don't wake up with the same problems they slept with someone else probably must have solved this issue by the time you are building your car you become a second mover now how what is the best way to approach or to solve this problem this guy said i just want to go from here to here right okay what can we build in the immediate to address this core problem of moving from point a to b right i can build a skateboard and then okay i build a skateboard i share with this user okay use this right the purpose of building a skateboard is actually to see will this solve this user's problem and in the process of using it what can i learn right so when this user hops on a skateboard oh yes he's able to go from point a to b but he's not convenient because he still has to paddle with his legs or it's not stable, it's shaky, right? Those are the kind of things you will then learn from this user. Then you go back and you iterate and you say, okay, he said it's not convenient, it's not balanced. Okay, let me put a handle, right? You you build a, uh, a scooter from a skateboard to a scooter. You have improved the first version by adding an increment, right? And this is what Agile allows us to do. You learn. You build, you learn, and you increment, or you 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 adapt, right? So you, you adapt the future by incrementing. You add more value to that product. So that's what we've done with the second phase. We build a scooter for this user to use. But then there's still a problem. Yes, I'm now more balanced, but I still use my legs. I still pad. I still paddle with my legs to move from point A to B. So yeah, you've solved the problem of moving from point A to B, but I'm not convenient. Like it's not convenient. I'm not comfortable using it. Okay, say fine. Let me build a bicycle so you don't have to use your legs to paddle. Now you can use your legs to just cycle, right? And now there's a seat so the user can sit comfortably and paddle. So this guy can now move from point A to B to an extent he's comfortable. But then he comes back to tell you, I was paddling and I got tired of paddling. Like my my knees hurt from paddling. So yeah, he still has a problem, right? He's still not comfortable so your product is not convenient enough okay let's iterate okay how can we still improve on this bicycle to move from point a to b but this time he doesn't have issues with the seats he doesn't have issues with the two tires for now he only has issues with the paddling okay let's use fuel right so you build a motorcycle that runs on fossil fuel and then you give this to the user he uses it he say oh wow this is better i love this but it's not balanced yesterday i fell from it and I nearly broke my leg, right? Mm, okay, that means this guy needs a full tire um, personal transport system, a car. So let's add four tires to this, right? And probably one of the feedback he gave you was that he tried to carry his friend, 
his friends, and he only, he only carried one of his friends, right? One of his friends. So let's build something that would make him more comfortable, right? That will solve that problem of not balancing the transport system. So let's build a car with four wheels, but this time there are additional seats for his friends, and it's now more comfortable, right? Yeah, so at the end of the day, we found out that we built a car for this user, right? But we didn't wait for five years to build a car because we already have products in the market that users are using to an extent. These products are solving this user's problems and we're getting revenue from it, right? It's different from the first approach, which is the user wants a car, his car we want to build. No, this user did not say he or she wants a car. The user said, I just want to go from point A to B. So give me something that can get me from point A to B, right? So this is how, or this is the basic concept of an MVP. What is that very little thing? That very little thing that I can build that can start addressing the user's fundamental problem, right? It's also the same case of the user telling you, I cannot see in the dark. Um, Thomas Edison probably would have just jumped on it and built a light bulb. But yeah, we know that we all started with candle flames, we had lanterns before we now had bulbs. They were solving our problems in those days, even though I wasn't born, but I know for sure it was solving the problems of darkness, right? So yeah, this is the basic concept of an MVP. And um, to further buttress this, we need to look at what are the features or policies that defines an MVP, right? An MVP is one that must be designed with the user's needs and emotions in mind, just like we have seen. The guy did not say he wants a car, he just wants a problem, his problem solved. So your MVP must solve a problem, must take um, notes of that user's problem and start solving it, right? It must be valuable. Remember we talked about value. Value is simply benefit. So the user must enjoy from using that thing. It is something that is usable. So if you look at the very first, uh, not like this, Right, you release a tire that's not valuable to your user. I don't know what the user is supposed to do with the tire, for example. Right, so it, your MVP must be usable, and if it must be usable, then of course it's actually solving the problem. And lastly, it must be functional. Right, a tire is not functional, two sets of tires are not functional. Right, but a scooter is functional. Right, so those are the key things we need to bear in mind when we understand. And so, why is this important for product managers? Now, you need to begin to start thinking about how we build, right? Even as founders, the time you spend trying to solve all the, ensuring that your product has all the features that will solve all the problems you learned during your exploration phase, right? You can actually use those time to release the first version, solve problems immediately, and then build incrementally, right? This also applies to founders. If you are a founder, you need to launch your startup, you need to get seed funds, you need to employ or you need to start thinking about the concept of uh, MVPs, right? All right, so we'll pause here. I don't know if anyone has any question to ask. Just to be sure I still have you guys. Okay, so I think we're good. Um, yeah. So let's um, so let's look at you know why MVPs should be or why founders or product man and product managers need to build MVPs or why MVP is important to these guys, right? So as a founder, you are somebody who has an entrepreneurial mindset. You are creative, you're innovative, you are a risk taker, you've identified a problem that you want to solve, you want to build a business around. Right, and then you go about, um, you know, like having out the budget for yourself. Okay, I need to spend this amount of money to build this X product so that I can get users, um, get retention, get users to stick, so I can raise funds to scale the product and scale the business. Right, and you have just very short time to do this if you. You know, take the traditional approach of trying to ensure that your product, you know, has all the features and solves all the user problems you've identified. Then you figure out that you'll be spending a lot of money, right? I remember business is the purpose of business is to make profit, 
product managers are also founders. The only difference is this guy is an entrepreneur. He's basically a founder in a company, right? He's a CEO of a product. He's a mini CEO. I, I remember one time where um, a, a product manager was asked to define what he does and he said he's a mini CEO, right? That was the first time I heard that and I started thinking about it. It kind of makes sense to me because just like founders, you make decisions regarding the products. You make basic decisions about the products you manage, right? Everything about the products is solely, you know, rest on your coffers, right? So as product managers, you also have that um, goal of trying as much as possible to reduce cost while also maximizing profit, just like a founder, right? Because if you're a product manager and all you do is waste money for the organization, come on, uh, before you know it, you will no longer be a product manager in that company, right? So you need to think about how best to optimize your development process such that you're not spending so much money for the business, right? And you're building a product that is so valuable that it can immediately start solving problems that users are now willing to pay you for. So you start making money for the business, right? So both founders and product managers have the same goal of reducing cost and maximizing profits. So as a result, MVP is a key conversation for these guys, right? So yeah, that's what MVP does, basically. If you have to reduce costs or save costs and you have to uh, increase revenue, then you need to start thinking about how you can solve problems immediately. When you solve problems immediately, you increase the speed of delivery and reduce the time in which you go to market. What it means is you are going to cut costs, right? This applies to both founders and product managers. And when you build an MVP, remember we said an MVP must be valuable and it must be usable, right? And it also must be functional. So it means as soon as you build the MVP and it gets to the market, while you are learning, you are iterating, right? If I'm a user that has told you that I need to get from point A to B and you give me a scooter the next day, come on, guys, I'm going to actually stick around because I know you are learning from me to give me what I actually want, right? So that's going to build brand loyalty. And what we've seen over time is brand loyalty directly translates to increased customer lifetime value, right? Customer is going to stick around, retention of, on your product is going to increase, and they will constantly come back to use your product. And when they do, it means they are getting value from it and they are willing to give value to keep getting that value that your product offers. So they are willing to always pay. So you're going to make money and maximize profits from just building an MVP as a founder as a product manager, right? So it's very critical that we need to start thinking you know, along the lines of you know, holding MVPs as serious conversations in our product teams or in our startups, right? Now, there are so many um, companies, so many big companies, unicorns, um, you know, um, Fortune 500 companies or even tech giants today that you know, started off building MVPs. Uh, it's a good example are these guys on the screen, Airbnb, Spotify, and Facebook. If you look very closely, you can see what Spotify was like. The first version of Spotify was mostly around just streaming, just streaming music. And in fact, um, when I was reading about Spotify, I also saw a movie about you know Daniel Craig and his team and how they came about Spotify. The very first version, they had illegal music. This music, on those, the music on those platforms at that time were not licensed, right? So they were just um, had coding music into the system so that users can just come, uh, play, pick any song they want, and just play directly. So it was mostly around streaming music. There was nothing about podcasts. There was nothing around uh, about um, playlists or suggesting music or auto recommendation driven apart by AI, right, or whatever. It was just solely. Um, streaming, which was the core function or the core um, user problems that they wanted to solve at the time. Airbnb, same thing. Um, two guys ran out of rent money and needed to rent out their their space to strangers, right? Um, and then they just started up something that got you know, a few users to come on board, and you know they rented out their space and they used uh, what's it called. Uh, floated uh, beds to provide that solution to them. So it's just, you know, just something very basic. You just cooked up a very basic website where you can search, okay, I'm coming to this area. Do you have anybody that can rent out a space? Yes, pay 
remove it, right? You spend the night when it expires, you leave. Same thing for Facebook. The Facebook profile page was, it was very basic. There was nothing interesting about it, right? There was no, any form of recommendation at the time. It was just very, very basic, right? So yeah, these guys all started out as MVPs. So imagine them at that time wanting to solve all the problems they could think of before launching or before releasing their first version. They probably wouldn't have been where they are today, right? So it's good that we, you know, start thinking around the concept of MVPs and adopting that as well. So we've said so many things about MVPs, right? But let's bring it home. Even MVPs can cost you money. Right, as product managers, especially in the software space, if you are a product manager or a founder of a tech company, or you're managing a tech product or software product, a SaaS product, or anything, you realize that to write code to bring your ideas to life requires a lot of commitments. This commitment could be in the form of resources be in the form of resources in the form of you know like technical know-how and money right the tech skill set when i say tech skill set i mean the guys that actually write codes is not so i mean it's scarce right um you don't get to see developers everywhere you go so what it means is the few ones you would see to hire to build your products to life would most likely be expensive so this mostly speaks to founders, and it also applies to product managers as well. When you are building out your MVP, remember we said what MVP does is to help you reduce costs and maximize profits, which is why we are all in business anyways, right? You need to think about what are the options, what are the alternatives available to me in building this MVP? As a product manager, as a founder, you could start thinking about if I should hire a developer, it's going to cost me this, and it's going to take longer time because he will write quotes, right? And most times developers are not really forthcoming. Sorry, apologies to any developer on this call. But yeah, sometimes developers are not always forthcoming with the right estimates of building a software product, right? So they would always want to buy time for themselves to test their quotes and do some other debugging, you know, and product managers, founders, the business guys, you guys are not patient when it comes to that because time means money. More time on the delivery means more money spent. So you're trying to reduce the delivery time so you can save more money and make more profit, right? So you need to start thinking about, okay, there is something actually called no code. And it's simply what it is. It's simply what it sounds like. It's simply what, uh, what the word entails build without quotes, right? You build without writing lines of code. Yes, there is something actually called that. There are features, sorry, there are tools that exist that enable you to build products without actually writing any quotes. And some of these features, sorry, some of these tools mostly are uh, drag and drops, right? They provide this visual development environment for you to use and then bring your products to life without having to write any line of code. Some of them will make it very easy that you have templates, pre-built templates that you can simply use without even doing any drag and drop. So these no-code tools help you save time and then help you reduce cost as well, right? So it's something we need to start considering as well uh, when it comes to making decisions as to how we want to build our MVP. So what are the, you know, the very popular no-code tools we have today? One of the OGs is WordPress. Uh, WordPress have been around for a very long time, as long as I can remember. Um, the the issue with WordPress today is that it is built on PHP, and there are no enough there are not enough you know supports around it, right? But the community is actually very big, and there are a lot of people using WordPress to build their products. We have Bubble, we have Adalo, Etable, Flutterflow. These are all the different local tools we have today. There are a lot of them that we can actually use, and they're very flexible. Uh, some of them are very some of them are free to use some of them are not free so they will give you a freemium but access to certain features you have to be on a premium premium plan right so there are some startups that have been built on no code that are very very successful today um these are very few ones that i wanted to share with you 
And the one that you know stands out for me is BIT, the Bloom Institute of Technology. So it's a tech school, just like tech physics, right? But their solution is built with no code. It's built such that you can access courses on demand. And as funny as it sounds, they've raised over hundred million dollars, right, so far. And they're still running on no code to today. So their every was built on no code, but the full feature, the full product still runs on no code, right? So Flexi, Flexible and Connect are also some startups that were built on no code. All right, so I'm going to stop here and then take any questions before we build a live product. I think someone had their hands up. Okay, um, Deborah, you have a hand up. Okay. You can go ahead and ask a question. Hello. Hi, Deborah. You have your hands up. Is that intentional? Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, okay, I guess it was an error. All right. So we'll build um, a product today, right? Uh, so when I was coming up with a choice of product to build for this class, I had a couple of options. Okay, Deborah just typed. She said... Okay, good evening. That was a mistake. Please. Okay, yeah, it's fine, Deborah. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I was thinking of, you know, like what to build for this session, right? And I was also thinking around what is that one thing that is that we can all resonate with, you know, when it comes to technology and software. And AI came to mind, right? So I was thinking, okay. How can I build an AI product? So today I'm going to build an AI product. Actually, I'm going to be a, build an AI powered product, right? With no code. It's an MVP, it's AI powered, and it's on no code. Right? And at the end of this, you know, workshop, I'm going to call it a workshop or a practical live session, you should be able to start looking at if you have an idea, right? How can you use what you've seen here today? To build your idea without actually writing any code. Because it's very possible. Right? So today I'm going to build a recipe app because just because I told you that I like to cook. And I remember saying in my free time, you catch me looking for recipes or trying out new recipes. So I'm going to build a no code MVP powered by AI, right? That would help me or anyone like me looking for recipes for different or any product in the world to you know to make their food right so that's what i'm going to build it today so i'm not going to go into details you know in terms of the product flow but i want us to think about it this way right so i'm supposed to actually use mirror to diagram to explain the flow but because of time i'm not going to do that but i'm going to walk you through it Imagine I want to build this same recipe app or an app that will enable anybody to generate recipes, right? So um, if I want to do that, what it means is I would have to, first of all, hire a UI UX guy to design what the prototype or do a mock-up for me of what it should look like, right? Then I would also hire a front-end developer who is probably going to charge me $2,000 per hour, right? To help me bring the concept to life. I'm also going to hire someone, a back-end guy probably, who is going to build a system that would generate these recipes for me. And the guy is probably going to also charge me nothing less than $3,000 per hour. I can be, I'm just exaggerating now, right? So I just want you to begin to see the cost implication of writing codes. I'm not saying writing codes are wrong. So I can see some devs on this call. <laughs> Don't block me on the road, please. Writing code isn't wrong. It's actually the best way to build a product. But I mean, if I found that you need to build fast, I need to get your product in front of investors as quickly as possible. So there's an alternative, why not use it? Right. 
And let's assume the UI UX guy is going to tell me it's going to take me three weeks to come up with a mock-up for or to come up with a design for this product. The web developer is going to tell me it's going to take three weeks also, right? I know it's going to be more than that. There are lots of them on this call. It's going to be more than that. But let's say three weeks, right? Uh, the backend guy who's actually going to write the algorithm, define the logics for generating a recipe for me for the different kinds of food that I want. It's probably going to take a month, right? So that is four, six weeks. That's 10 weeks. That's two months and two weeks to build this recipe up. Two months and two weeks to build this recipe up. And it's going to cost me $2,000, $3,000, That's $7,000, right? Let's assume that they are charging for the period that they will spend building this product. It's going to cost me $7,000. It's going to cost me two weeks, sorry, two months and two weeks to build this recipe up. Now it's an MVP, so it means it's just very basic. So it's going to take two months and two weeks to build just something very, 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 very basic, right? Guys, today on this call, I'm going to build that same product, right? I'm going to be my UI UX guy. I'm going to be my web front end web developer guy. And I'm going to enlist the services of somebody that we know to be my back end guy, right? And we are all going to build this product together today. Our MVP will be ready today by the end of this call. And I'm not going to spend any money and i'm going to do that within an hour right so are you guys excited you can just use the reaction stream here if you're excited so we can get started okay cool 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 i can see some lovely reactions all right so let's start let's start okay so for the ui ux right I'm not going to spend time building that from scratch. It's in my head. So I have the designs in my head. So I'm going to go ahead to build it. So I'm not going to teach you what to do. Just watch me while I do it, right? So I'm going to uh, come up with the designs on the fly. And I'm going to be doing the front end as well on the fly. But like I said, I'm going to enlist the services of somebody that we know. OK, it's not a bot, but an assistant that we know for ChatGPT to be my back end, right? So instead of hiring a developer to build the backend, ChatGPT would be my backend. Okay, so today I'm going to be using a no-code tool called Bobo. Remember, it was part of the local tools that I showed you earlier, and it's actually one of the one of the you know the top local tools that I've seen a lot of founders, startup founders use, and product managers as well beginning to adopt. Right, so it's cool. After this call, you can take your time. Research Bubble and create an account on Bubble is free. Um, they also have a premium plan. They have features that are locked in the premium plans. For you to have access to them, you have to pay, right? Excuse me. So the sign up process is actually very easy. Um, just go to bubble.io. I hope I have the best network today. Yeah, I think I do. So because I've signed up, this is what my ID looks like. If you haven't signed up, if I log out, you see an option for you to sign up. It just, it, it won't take anything within 30 to, you know, if you're not fast, 60 minutes to sign up. And all that is required is just your email address and we set up an, a password for you to proceed, right? So let's assume I've signed up, I have access to my account. Now I want to build an app. Once you log in, this is the first, um, the, this is the first environment. This is sort of like a landing page. So I'm going to say create an app. So I'm going to call this. Um, what do I call this? Willow's. Let's call it Willow's Kitchen. Oh no no. Let's say Willow's Recipe app. Right. That's what I want to call this. So I click on Get Started. Okay. So start the basic features. Like I said, it's, it's actually, they have a premium plan. They also have a free trial plan, or they have a free um, access plan, or you know you can have access to limited features. Once you access others, then you have to pay. So I'm fine, I skip this. So this is what my development environment looks like, right? So this is where I'm going to be building these products. 
So remember, like I said, this is going to be a recipe app. So it's just going to be very basic, MVP basic. But let's go back. What is the problem we're trying to solve with this recipe app? I love to cook. I always look for recipes to cook. Most times I find myself on YouTube or I find myself on Google looking up recipes for a specific meal, right? The last one I made was, I think, chicken curry sauce. And I actually got that from YouTube. Now let's assume there's actually a web app or a mobile app I can actually go to and then type what I want and it gives me um, a description of the meal and it tells me very basically, right, the ingredients that I need and then the steps, you know, to make that meal. But I think that would be awesome. So let's let's give it a try. So first I'm going to start by um, editing this. So I want it to be um, sort of like, you know, a web app. So I have to define uh, the layout for this guy, right? So I want it to be, um, uh, let's say custom, right? Let's make it custom. I will reduce this to say five, six, seven. Right. So I'm okay with this width. Uh, the height can be a bit longer. Uh, let's call it, let's say 1,000. Right. Okay, so I have my environment, so I'm going to drag. Um, remember I also said that one of the features of no code is drag and drop, right? And a visual environment to develop. So that's exactly what you're seeing here. So there are a lot of features on the left pane. You can see, sorry, not features now, but sort of like elements, design elements or tools. You can see text, buttons, icons, link, image. Ideally, if we were to build this with codes, the developers will have to write codes for each of these elements, right? So this is making it very much easier for us. So let me pick a group. Uh, I want to have this floating group here. All right, so let me go to go. Um, I don't want this guy to move. So you don't mind all these things I'm doing. I'm just trying to be uh, as fast as possible. Right, so. Just behind to, I would say 80. 80 is fine. Uh, let me just pick random colors. So I'm just trying to create sort of like a header for this application. So let me make it green. So the new thing to do at this point would be for a designer to actually come up with what the app should look like, right? So like I said, I'm my own designer, so I'm designing this app. Sorry, someone asked a question. Okay, I guess that was a mistake. All right, please feel free to stop and ask any question if you want to. If you have any question, you can, you can quickly just ask. Right. Okay, so usually an app like this will have a navigation bar. So let me drop an image, upload the navigation menu. So this is a hamburger menu. I'll be using this for layouts. Uh, I want it to have zero minimal width. Um, I want the height to be, say, 40. Right. Okay. So the width should be, let's say, zero. Uh, this width is actually too much. Yeah, Zina, please go ahead. You have a question. Hi, 
Hi, America. Good evening. I uh, want to find out, is it a web app or a mobile app that you're working on? It's actually a web app, right? Um, it's a web app, but I want to use mobile elements to design it. So again, it doesn't really matter, right? If I had my UI US guy do some things for me, then I'll just copy and paste, right? But I'm just trying to design on the fly. So that's why I'm just coming up with, um, what's it called? Um, design concepts on, the, on this call. I don't know if that makes sense. It does, thank you. All right, thanks. Zero, let the height be. Let's see. Okay, so why is it hiding here? Okay. Okay, so let me bring in um, another layout. Let's call it. Uh, Let's call it uh, sorry. Okay. Let me bring in uh, where has this guy gone to? So I need to add something that looks like a logo. Mm, let me add this guy. So I want something that looks like a logo. So let's uh, call this minimum weights as well. Sorry, this is the most boring part of this. Uh, this is the most boring part of this work. some reason this thing is not responding so let me just see if i can delete the elements and add them from scratch um, yeah that's right so why is it showing me the problem Hi, hey, Mecca. I'm raising my hand. This is Lua Tai. I've been really used. So, sorry, sorry. Hi. Yeah, let me, let me jump in. If you have, um, you can show us something that is finished and um, just maybe walk back from there if that works. Um, okay, I actually wanted to design from scratch. Yeah, um, we're running against time. Okay, time. All right, so let me mm -hmm. see. Okay, yeah, um, I think I've built something similar to this before. But also, I also wanted to show you guys how to connect this to ChatGPT to function as the back end. And then, um, you know, how you can use ChatGPT API references and API keys on any of your tools. Maybe what we can do is, um, time we can have an arrangement to have a separate session for this, uh, maybe because of time. I don't know if that's fine, but it's actually very important that yes, we, we can we can have an agreement later. Um, but because of time, let's just do a walk back from you know the one you built fully up before. Thank you. All right. So this is um the recipe app that I built before, right? Um I just wanted to I built this for you know to demonstrate for one of the product managers I was speaking to about the possibility of doing this, right? So like I said, the basic, this is an MVP, very basic, right? And what this is supposed to do is to help me get recipes. 
right, for the different um, meals or food that I want to cook. So assuming that I want to make jollof rice, right? This has already been programmed in such a way that whatever thing you type here is sent to the back end, you know, via this app calling ChatGPT API to generate responses based on whatever I key in here, right? So I wish I had the time to show you guys in details how this works. So let's say I want to make, can anybody suggest anything that they would like to make this weekend? The lock price. Why is your love price? Anything that came to your mind? Okay, so let's say your love price. Right? So when you type your love price here, yeah. once you tap on or you click on get recipe, so what is happening here happening here is that this app is making a call to chat GPT to get the recipes for us to see, right? So it's gonna take a while. And let's see what the response will come with. So like I said, this is just very basic, right? This is an MVP. And actually start you know you know share this with your family and friends or people who you perceive will need this to start getting recipes on the fly in fact someone like Tyre who wants to cook jello fries tomorrow that's really a very good starting point you know to stop surfing the net you can go to this app and then type jello fries and get a response so it's making a call to charge GPT. let's see how long this is going to take sorry it's taking a while i'm on gpt 3.5 and that's why it's this very slow on 4.0 it will be faster than this because um you have higher tokens right and then the temperature rate is high on gpt 4.0 so i'm using 3.5 so that's why it's very slow so let's see if it's going to come back to response okay so it came back with something um came back saying okay nigerian jollof rice description of nigerian jollof rice uh, it's telling me what the ingredient all the ingredients that i need the quantity of each item that i need to build this actually there is more right i think what is happening here is that um the size of the screen is is smaller so it's not showing you know the remaining response so it's also supposed to show you the steps you know of how you can proceed to cook this journal of rice right i wish i had the time to show you this actually very exciting especially Know, knowing that you can use an assistant to build your back end while programming the front end yourself, or you can hire somebody who is a web dev or an app dev to use the no code to build the front end for you, right? So what we have succeeded in doing is build something really fast that anybody can use, right? And um, not spending any money on it. So I actually wish like we had enough time to show you in details how this would work. All right, so Tyro, I don't know um, if it is cool to pause here, and then maybe we can have other sessions where we can show this, you know, in real time. Okay. All right, thank, thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much, Omeka. This um, topic is really interesting. I was already getting really into the no code part i think it's really interesting i've heard of no code before but i've never really seen a no code you know app before and given the way you have explained the concept of an mvp it just makes sense that you know if you are rolling out the first the core features of of an app first then it makes sense that you don't spend so much resources and you know no code is just the way so thank you so much. This was really, really insightful and we really appreciate it. So I think there are a couple of questions for you in the chat box. And some people are already raising their hands. So um, which one should we do? Let's take one in the chat box first. So the first one says, um, Chilo says, does Bubble have a text to speech functionality? Yes, Bubble does, uh, but it's one of the the premium features of Bubble, right? So if you're on the premium, you are limited to the elements you can access. But if you're on premium, you have access to a wide range of elements, including uh, text to speech. Yeah, Chile. Okay. Um, okay. 
let's see is there a link or okay deborah says please is there a link or resources that can help us further yes there are a lot of resources out there um i will share some with techniques um, they will do well to extend them across to you yeah, I personally think that we should even have a session that we just show like the demonstration of it because me, I was already it was already entering my body. I'm like, I, I want to really try this. Yeah, you know, try it out and maybe even post on my LinkedIn. I have my own question that I want to ask because I was following closely. But um, is there anyone else that has a question? Adenike has put a um, Google Forms link in the chat box so please try to click the link and fill the um survey that we have there to be really helpful for us to make you know bits and bytes better so does anyone else have any question um yes i have one more question okay mm -hmm. The integration with ChatGPT. Did you have to? I mean, does Bobo have a, an API or an adapter that allows you to connect to ChatGPT directly? Sorry, Chilo, can you take that again? Sorry, apologies. Yeah, the connection to ChatGPT. Does Bobo yeah. have like a functionality or an adapter that allows you to just connect to ChatGPT automatically, or you had to do some tweaks? To get that, to yeah. So you can actually connect to ChatGPT automatically, right? Um, I know you're there, so you can relate to what I'm about to say. ChatGPT has API references that you can use on Bobo, right, to connect directly. Uh, you can also connect manually if you, you know, have to enter all those um, uh, requests, JSON quotes, right? So, but yeah, you can connect automatically with ChatGPT. It's actually very easy with Bobo. Very easy. I wish we had the time. But yeah, looking forward to when we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay, let me quickly ask my question before um, other people decide to ask. Yeah, as if they still have questions. So, is there a specific reason why you picked Bubble? Is it that that's the best one? Because you showed us a couple. And I know it's, it's definitely not about the cost because the one you used is the free version. So is yeah. there a particular reason why you picked Bobo? Yeah, so um, that is, that's a very beautiful question. And it's also part of what I skipped in my um, presentation, right? The choice of what or which, uh, what's it called, local tool to use depends on a, a range of factors, right? One of them is cost. Um, Bobo is relatively cheaper to Adalo or Flutterflow, for example. I think Flutterflow is free um, or Etable, right? So cost is a very big factor to consider. The other factor to consider is ease of use. Etable is not easy to use at all because it requires you to do some backend gymnastics, connecting to Zapier and a lot of third-party applications before you can use it. So but bubble with bubble is very easy to connect, you know, to connect to plugins, just like I was explaining to Chilo, it was very easy to connect to Chat GPT, for example. And I think Bubble has the best um Chat GPT connection or connection route than you know any of those um local tools. And the other thing or the other factor to consider is how easy is the development or the design environment, right? Um, do they have a lot of elements that you can use there are some local tools that when you are using you have to use too many plugins wordpress is a typical example you have to use too many what uh, sorry plugins to build a website on a wordpress right and that is not the case for mobile you simply just have all the elements there you just drag and drop every element as you saw me doing right uh, that you want to add so it's it's you know a combination of these factors and more Right, that would determine what or which of the codes or which of the tools to use. Yeah, so I chose Bubble because one, it is cheaper, it is easy to connect to backend services or third party application. It has a lot of elements. 
and um, the development of design environment is actually very easy to do. So yeah, to summarize, Jadida. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Dora has a couple of questions for you. Three questions, actually. So wow. the first one is, what measures are in place to ensure the security of the application developed using Bubble? Oh, that's a very nice question. So if uh, we proceeded further and we deploy this application, you'll see that you can actually deploy on any host server that you want, right? And the security for, I'm not a DevOps person, but I know that um, different host servers have, uh, what's it called? Different um, security infrastructures embedded in them, right? So yeah, um, Bobo is just a no-code, it's just a tool to build. When you're done building, you host it somewhere where the security will then be provided. So Dora, I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay. How does Bobo hand, no, okay. I've asked that one. Oh no. How does uh, Bobo handle compliance requirements, especially in re regulated industry? Okay, another beautiful question. Um, that has nothing to do with Bobo, right? If you're being very honest. Um, as product managers, your duties, part of your role is to understand the industry you, you're creating or the industry you you are, you know, that you, you serve, right? So if you're building a, a financial technology product, you need to know what are the compliance requirements you need your product needs to have. So those are the features, sorry, the requirements you need to um, take note of when you are building the application, whether you're using no code or you're using code, whichever the case or whichever the route you're taking to build the MVP, you always need to make sure that all requirements, um, whether regulatory or compliance or risk or you know user requirements are actually you know taking note of uh, before you start building. So it has nothing to do with Bob. Bob is just a development tool. Bob is just helping you to build fast. I reduce cost and make profits, right? That's just what Bobo does. Okay. So Dara's last question is, have there been any challenges in coordinating efforts or ensuring consistency in development? Mm, coordinating efforts, yes. So no code to, so I, I, if I understand you clearly, so I'm just trying to paraphrase your question. Uh, you're trying to know if it allows for collaboration, effective collaboration during the development process. Yes, it does. Most no-code tools, in fact, it's part of the feature of most no-code tools. And it's fact, it's something that no-code tools are now, you know, um, factoring into their, you know, it's part of the new features that they release now, right? The ability for users to collaborate on the projects in real time. So while developing that, if I had wanted Dora to be on that project, I would have just sent her a link to join me, but it's a premium feature on Bubble. Uh, other local tools um, have that feature. I'm not sure WordPress has it, but yeah, WordPress will only enables you to create multiple users so you guys can log in and work on the projects at the same time, but not in real time, but Airtable, uh, Flutterflow, Bubble allows for real-time collaboration. So you can log in, and then um, see your colleague, you guys can work and collaborate on a project and ensure that um, delivery, sorry, the delivery, you know, is smooth, right? So yeah, Dora, if I, if I understand you clearly, uh, you want to know if Bobo allows for real time team collaboration. Yes, it does. Okay, so any questions before close? Okay, I don't think there are any more questions. So, so Dora, ask your question. Dora has another question. You can unmute your mic to ask. Okay, okay all right. Good evening. Uh, instead of typing, I think I should just ask. So, my last question. My last question is that um, how scalable, how scalable is the solution built on Bubble? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, so I, I showed you, yeah, very beautiful question as well. You know, during the course of my presentation, I showed you startups that built their MVP with no codes and now run full blown products on no code still. And some of them have gone ahead to raise a lot of money, right? Um, there are limitations, no doubt. There are times when you might want to be very flexible that no code will not allow you to be. And in such cases, you now need to uh, engage the services of a web dev, right? WordPress is one no code platform that have been, you know, has been debated over time to, you know, whether it's, it's a no code or, or is a code, right? Because it allows for flexibility. At some point, you can actually write a code on WordPress. But that's not the case on Bubble. I don't know if you are working on it. I haven't really explored so much their premium feature so much. I don't know if at some point you can actually write codes on your products. But yeah, it, it, there's a limitation with no code, which is that at some point you can't scale, right? Because of the, um, it is not fluid. It's not flexible as writing a code. You have to then require, especially in cases where you require customization, then you have to write codes. In that case, yes, you need a developer, right? And I wouldn't know how the combination of code and no code is going to work, but I think that it is possible to extract the code of a no code because if we're being honest, every single thing running on no code is written, is powered by a code. Uh, those drag and drop elements are all codes. Remember I said, if you were coding, the developer would have written lines of code for each of those elements, right? But no codes makes it easy. They've already written the code, just drag and drop what you need. So yeah, you would still need a developer if there are cases where you need to customize your solution or make it more flexible. Yeah, Dora. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Emeka. Immediately I get off this webinar, I'm going to build my own no code so I can raise 100 million that you said those people raised. That's what I'm going to do right now. So thank you so much. Really uh, I, can't wait. I can't wait to use your product. Just let me know once you're done. <laughs> no problem. Right. I'll be in your DM. All right. right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I don't know if Tayo has something to say before we close. Hi, hi. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for your attention and patience and everything in between. Um, thank you so much. I'm just here, you know. I'm confused now with everything that you were speaking of earlier. Thank you so much. Uh, nothing from me is that we have the feedback for the chat room that he has been from time to time. Please, 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 we want to be best and we want to be um, doing and what we need to be doing. So please uh, fill in the form and um, we'll be happy to post a fantastic person for December and, you know, we'll have another time for being somebody. Thank you so much. Um, all right, nothing else for me. Let's go back to you. So if you need recordings of the class, it's going to be sent to your mail. You can always just go through um, again in case you missed anything and look forward to a full on course on no code development from Tech soon. We drop it soon and, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please fill the survey form and yeah, we'll send a recording to your email. Thank you very much. Bye.
Hi, everyone. The meeting is over. Um, somebody also just joined, Cynthia. The meeting is over. Um, Cynthia, the meeting is over. You can leave the call. Well, um, 